How does an airplane run out of fuel in VFR conditions in sight of the airport? Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com and you are listening to the Private Pilot Podcast brought to you by our number one rated online ground school, groundschoolacademy.com. We are back doing more podcasts across all of our podcasts, the Private Pilot Podcast, the Instrument Pilot Podcast, the Commercial Pilot Podcast, and of course, the CFI Certificated Flight Instructor Podcast. Back to podcasts once per week, once across each channel. So this week's the Private Pilot Podcast. Next week, you'll have something new on the Instrument Pilot Podcast, and we're going to follow that all the way around month after month. Yesterday, we posted a video on our YouTube and Facebook channels about United Flight 173. And I posed the exact same question. How does an airplane run out of fuel in VFR conditions in sight of the airport here? And that's the exact accent we want to dive into and look into a little bit more. Before we do that, I want to update you just on a few little things happening around here at M0A.com. First off, Sun and Fun is coming up at the end of this month, March 31st through April 5th. We'll be there. We're in Hangar D, Hangar Delta. I hope you'll come by and stop by to say hi, as well as that Saturday. That Saturday at 12 p.m., we'll have our good friend Steve-O in the booth as well, taking pictures and saying hi to everybody. Um, also, uh, this month, March 26, put this on your calendars, March 26 at 3 p.m., we're going to be concluding this 7700, 7700, of course, the emergency transponder squat code. So this in-flight emergencies, diving, learning more about accidents type series. We're going to be concluding that with a live stream on March 26th at 3 p.m. And I will be recreating and redoing probably one of the first accidents I ever actually dug into that being the JFK Jr. accident. We did that probably five years ago now. All new animations, uh, a new way to look at the content, some new research I have found that'll all be shared live on our YouTube and on our Facebook channels, March 26, 3 p.m. And uh, lastly, if you're thinking about getting into aviation, be sure to grab a copy of the Private Pilot Blueprint. It is yours free. All I ask is that you pay shipping, privatepilotblueprint.com, everything I wish someone would have told me before I started my flight train. Let's dive into United Flight 173. When the FAA showed up, when the NTSB showed up, they asked that same simple question. We're going to be talking about all this week. How does an airplane run out of fuel in VFR conditions in sight of the airport? It's the question that perplexed the FAA and NTSB when they showed up. And in order to understand the answers to that question, we have to dig a little bit deeper. So I've got my 19 page uh, NTSB report here in front of me, and we're gonna go ahead and read through this a little bit together. On December 28th, 1978, United Airlines Flight 173 at McDonnell Douglas DC-8 was scheduled to fly from John F. Kennedy JFK Airport in New York to Portland International Airport, Portland, Oregon, with an en route stop in Denver, Colorado. There were 189 individuals on board. That includes the eight crew members. Now, the flight was cleared to Portland on its IFR flight plan, and the planned time and route was two hours, 26 minutes. They planned to arrive in Portland at 1713 local time. According to the automatic flight plan and monitoring system, the total amount of fuel required of this is sitting on the ground in Denver. They're taking on fuel. Some passengers got on, some passengers got off. We're now sitting in Denver and we're taking on fuel. The required fuel from Denver to Portland was 31,900 pounds. And again, to, that's hard to put into perspective when you and I were flying 172s and SR-22s and everything else. It's hard to really put that into perspective. 31,900 pounds. I'll help bring that perspective with this next number here. They took on 46,000 700 pounds. Required was 31,900 pounds. They took on 46,700. Let me bring that home for you and put it in perspective. That is just enough to be legal. That is like you and I, VFR day, saying I have enough fuel to fly to my destination, 
plus the required 30 minutes or IFR or whatever it is for the, the minimums for that particular flight. This is flying to the minimums. The NTSB actually says it here. Uh, that was enough. That, that fuel included the FAA regulation requirement for fuel to destination plus 45 minutes plus a company contingency, I'll give them that, of an extra 20 minutes on top of that. It's still literally just enough to be legal. The captain uh, even said, uh, we had some discussion about the fuel. The captain also explained his flight uh, from Denver to Portland was normal and our predicted fuel was a normal fuel burn here. And he said they did discuss it was close, but to the captain's defense, that was kind of the way things were done back in 1978. United Flight 173 is where crew resource management came from. We're going to learn about that here in a bit. This was still that culture of I'm the captain and what I say goes. So the captain says they had some discussion about it. Again, it's always a good sign in an NTSB report. They were able to interview the captain. So we know there were some survivors in this accident here. But they interviewed the captain. He said, we had some discussion about it, but it was just enough fuel to be legal. And I shared a second ago that was common of these time frames because carrying more fuel means carrying more weight, which means thus burning more fuel. That was all normal for back then. At 1705, Flight 173 called Portland Approach and advised that its altitude was 11,000 feet and its airspeed was being reduced. Portland responded and told the flight to maintain its heading for the visual approach to runway 28. Flight 173 acknowledged the approach instructions and stated, we have the field in sight. At 1707, two minutes later, Portland Approach instructed the flight to descend and maintain 8,000 feet. Flight 173 acknowledged the instructions and advised that they were leaving 10. At 1709, an additional two minutes later, Flight 173 received and acknowledged a clearance to continue its descent down to 6,000 feet. Now, during the post-accident interview, the captain stated that when Flight 173 was descending through 8,000 feet, the first officer who was flying the aircraft at the time requested the flaps be extended to 15, then asked for the landing gear to be lowered. And this is where our routine flight takes a little bit of a left turn, not literally, but just look at the crew resource management that happens here. We extended the landing gear as normal, and it was noticeably unusual, the captain said. I felt it seemed to come down more rapidly as my recollection. It was a thump, thump, bang sound. Uh, you could feel it. I don't recall getting the red transit gear door light. I mean, remember our, our landing gear in transit light. I think we got a green nose gear light, but the other lights were off. The aircraft also remarkably yawed to the right. I, the flight attendant and passenger statements, also indicate uh, that there was a loud noise and a severe jolt when the landing gear was lowered. So that was the flight attendant and some passenger statements about a loud noise and severe jolt when the landing gear was lowered. As we shared in yesterday's video, and I'll do my best to catch you up if you haven't had a chance to see it just yet, but I do encourage you to go to the M0A YouTube and Facebook channels to see it because we actually simulate and recreate everything. United Flight 173 lost hydraulic pressure. Now, in this aircraft at the time, and in most landing gear systems, hydraulic pressure works to bring the landing gear up, and then along with gravity, Hydraulic pressure also works to bring it down nice and smoothly. Without that hydraulic pressure there, to really create that, that, that resistance, just gravity and 250 knots is what brings the, everything down, the landing gear down. In the case of United Flight 173, the mains came down so abruptly because of the 250 knots. I mean, in a descent as well. Gravity on top of it, that was the loud bang and the thumps and the yaws and everything else that they felt because it came down so abruptly. It came down so abruptly, it actually broke the little indicator switches that would have given them the three green lights in the first place. That's why they didn't get any green lights when they were looking in the cockpit. Our story, though, continues. At 1712, Portland Approach requested United 173 Heavy contact tower, Portland, uh, 118.7. The flight responded negative, we'll stay with you, we'll stay at five, uh, we'll maintain 170 knots, we've got a gear problem, we'll let you know. 
This is the first indication now that anybody on the ground knows that 173 is having an issue. And I like the the affirmative statement here. Negative, I'm going to stay with you. I've got a gear issue. I'll hold this altitude. I'll hold this speed. I need to work through this. Uh, there is nothing wrong with this statement here. I, you know, CFR 91.3 says we are the pilot in command. We have the final authority as to the safety of this flight, and they are clearly exercising that responsibility. I am I'm a okay with this statement here. To that statement, Portland Approach replied, United 173, Roger, maintain 5,000, turn left, heading 200, and the flight acknowledged their instructions. Portland Approach at 1714 advised United 173, heavy turn left, heading 100. Now, I'll just orbit you out there until you get your problem fixed. Flight 173 acknowledged the instructions. At this point, they never really entered into an official holding pattern. Um, you can see from, from recreations, they kind of enter into this triangular shaped holding pattern that they're working their way through as they're trying to troubleshoot anything. Now for the next 23 minutes, while Portland Approach was vectoring the aircraft in this holding pattern, kind of southeast, south and east of the airport, the flight crew discussed and accomplished all the emergency and precautionary items that were available to them. Now, at about 1738, Flight 173 contacted United Airlines System Line Maintenance Control Center in San Francisco. Dispatch, to put it in plain English. According to the recordings, at 1740, the captain explained to company dispatch and maintenance personnel the landing gear problem and what the flight crew had done to assure the landing gear was fully extended. One of the things he actually did, and on the McDonnell Douglas aircraft at the time, there was this tiny little indicator tab that actually would pop up on the wing route above each main wheel. And if this little indicator tab popped up, that would tell you that that particular wheel was down, locked, and straight. So put yourself in the shoes of all the passengers now. You just hear this loud bang, these, this thumping noise, the aircraft kind of yawed violently to the right, back to the left, and all of a sudden, the flight engineer comes out of the cockpit with a flashlight, walks all the way down all the aisles of all the seats to get to about the emergency, right after the emergency exit row. If you're sitting right over the wing, you're looking at it, asks the passengers to move, shines a flashlight out on the wing, and does, in fact, see the indicator tap. He goes to the other side of the fuselage, looks at the other wing, looks out there, shines it with his flashlight, and says, yes, I have that indicator tap. I know for a fact the mains are down, locked, and straight. At the time, there was no easy way to inspect the nose gear without removing panels and everything else. But we know for a fact at least the mains are down, locked, and straight. So they're explaining all of this to dispatch for over a 23-minute time period. Never forget, we took on just enough fuel to be legal. We never accounted for a little incident, we'll call it, a little landing gear issue. We're now holding for 23 minutes talking to dispatch here. And dispatch was smart enough to ask, how much fuel do you have right now? The captain reported about 7,000 pounds of fuel on board and stated his intentions to hold another 15 or 20 minutes. He stated he was going to have the flight attendants prepare the passengers for an emergency evacuation. I've talked to many, many pilots who have flown uh, the entire line of McDonnell Douglas products, at least aircraft, and they shared, Jason, when you're at 7,000, 5,000 pounds of fuel even, this is like warning lights are coming on. This is when your car is flashing at you, telling you to get to the nearest gas station. That's how critical our fuel situation is in this range of roughly 7,000 pounds. This is also 1978. We don't have the same great totalizers and technology that we do um, today. So at 1744, United San Francisco asked, okay, United Flight 173, this is dispatch talking. You estimate you're going to make a landing five minutes past the hour. Is that okay? The captain responded, yeah, that's a good ballpark. I'm not going to hurry the girls. Again, this is 1978. Uh, they talked like that back then, okay? We got about 165 people on board, and we want to we want to take our time, get everybody ready to go. It's clear as a bell, and there are no problems. Profound statement, knowing what's coming here. The aircraft continued to circle under the direction of Portland Approach in a triangular pattern to the southeast of the airport, now at 5,000 feet. I don't know how familiar 
you are of, of turbine-powered aircraft, but the goal of any jet engine is to get it up uh, as high uh, and, and fast as possible because these things just suck gas down at the lower altitudes. So holding for 20 something plus minutes at 5,000 feet has taken their, their fuel burn and it's become literally exponential at this point now. So the aircraft's continuing to circle the pattern uh, with a, about 20 nautical miles from the airport. At 1746, the first officer asked the flight engineer, hey, how much fuel do we have? I assume, this is the first officer just thinking out loud, you know, probably very aware of how much fuel we have and asking the flight engineer. On the DCA at this time, the flight engineer was known as the plumber of the aircraft. There were so many different fuel tanks. They, they were always plumbing, moving fuel from this chamber to this chamber and all around this aircraft here. So how much fuel do we got? The flight engineer responds, 5,000. First officer just acknowledges, again, 5,000. This is warning lights on kind of stuff. The first officer asks the captain now, What's the fuel show now? This is two minutes after that previous conversation. The captain replied, five. The first officer repeated, five. At 1749, a few seconds later, after a, 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 a comment we couldn't understand on the black box by the flight engineer concerning the fuel pump lights, I assume it's a fuel-related issue, the captain stated, that's about right, the feed pumps are starting to blink. Now, According to data received from McDonnell Douglas, a manufacturer, the total, the total usable fuel remaining when the inboard feed pump lights illuminate is 5,000 pounds. So their fuel calculations were fairly accurate. Uh, at this time, according to the flight data recorder and air traffic control data, the aircraft was about 13 nautical miles south of the airport. Then, again, at 1749, the flight crew engaged in further conversation about the status of the landing gear. This conversation was interrupted by a heading change from Portland Approach and followed by a traffic advisory from Portland Approach. A minute later, the captain asked the flight engineer, hey, give us a current card on weight figure about another 15 minutes. This is where CRM starts to break down and the tension starts to build. 15 minutes? says the flight engineer, to which the captain replied, yeah, give us another three or 4,000 pounds on top of zero fuel weight. The flight engineer said, that's not enough. 15 minutes, 15 minutes is gonna run us really low on fuel here. Let me explain what he's saying. He's saying, I know these blinky lights here in front of me mean there's 5,000 pounds of fuel. I know, Mr. Flight Engineer, you're called the plumber and you know everything about this fuel system and you should know, you know to, the, to the pound how much fuel is on this aircraft right now. But I'm the captain, I'm telling you, We've got an extra 15 minutes of fuel. Don't, don't sweat it. Just, just add it into your numbers. Don't worry about it. We have a 15 minute buffer. And the flight engineer finally stands up and goes, I don't think you're right. You add us an extra, this imaginary 15 minutes of fuel, you're gonna run us really, really close on fuel here. Not enough, he says. 15 minutes is gonna run us really low on fuel here. The flight engineer gave the following information for the landing card. Okay, take 3,000 pounds, 204. At this time, the aircraft was about 18 nautical miles south of the airport and turned to the northeast. CRM is gonna to continue to break down. CR, when I say CRM, by the way, I mean crew resource management, how well we work together as a team. The captain instructed the flight engineer to, con uh, to contact the company representative at Portland and apprise him of the situation and tell them Flight 173 would land with about 4,000 pounds of fuel. As we're going to learn, nothing could be further from the truth. The flight engineer then talked to Portland, discussed the aircraft's fuel state, the number of persons on board the aircraft, and the emergency landing preparations at the airport. Now, because of an inquiry from the company representative at Portland, the flight engineer told the captain he wants to know if we'll be landing about five minutes after the top of the hour, to which the captain replied simply, yes. The flight engineer then reported, hey, the approach uh, descent check is complete. At 1756, the first officer said, how much fuel you got now? Two people of the three in this cockpit are worried about this fuel. The flight engineer responds again out loud, 3,000 pounds remain. This is serious warning lights on now. The captain, kind of ignoring the statement, says to the flight engineer, hey, can you go in the cabin and kind of check how things are going back there? Oblivious to this impending fuel issue. The flight engineer returns four minutes later and reports that the captain, or the, I'm sorry, the cabin would be ready in another two or three minutes. The flight engineer then, two minutes later, advises, we've got about three on the fuel, and that's it. 
The aircraft was then about five nautical miles south of the airport on a southwest heading. Excuse me one second. As they continue in there, Portland approached Ask Flight 173 for a status report. The first officer replied, yeah, we have an indication that our gear is normal. They're talking about those tabs out on the, on the wing route. It'll be our intention in about five minutes to land runway 28 left. We would like equipment standing by. Our indications are the gear is down and locked. We've got our people prepared for an evacuation in the event it should become necessary. At 18.03, Portland Approach asked Flight 173 to advise them when the approach would begin. The captain responded, uh, they've about finished in the captain. I guess another three or four minutes. This mysterious three or four minutes just never happens. I feel like we've been talking about in three minutes we'll be there, in three minutes we'll be there, in four minutes we'll be there. They just keep adding time to this, at least the captain does, forgetting about that fuel issue, but it's getting more and more interesting. Portland Approach then asked Flight 173 for the numbers of persons on board and the amount of fuel remaining. About 4,000, well, make it 3,000 pounds of fuel, the captain then says. This is about 10 minutes ago, if you look at the actual timeline, is when we had 3,000 pounds of fuel. We don't have that much anymore. From 1803 to 1806, the crew engaged in a conversation all about the landing gear. The captain said, hey, check the landing gear warning horn to see further evidence that the landing gear was fully down and locked. Check whether the automatic spoilers and anti-skid would operate normally. Uh, check the landing gear circuit breaker. Was that out? Then the flight attendant entered the cockpit and asked, how are you doing? Well, oh, I'm sorry. She was asked, how are you doing? She responded, I think we're ready. At this time, the aircraft was about 17 nautical miles south of the airport on a southwesterly heading. The conversation between the flight attendant and the captain continued for about another 30 seconds when the captain said, okay, we're going in. We should land in about five minutes. Almost simultaneously with this comment, the first officer said, I think you've lost number four, meaning the number four engine. Better get some cross feeds open there or something. There's a long, very awkward pause here. First officer then shouts, we are going to lose an engine. So previously, I, we're, I think we're losing number four. And there's silence. No one says anything. And the same first officer speaks up finally and says, we are going to lose an engine. The captain, one word, why? First officer also replies with one word, fuel. First officer, open up the cross feeds, man. The flight engineer says, we're going to lose number three in a minute too. It's showing zero. The captain, you've got a thousand pounds. You have to, empathetically as he says that. We had 5,000 in there, but we lost it. The captain says, all right, flight engineer, are you getting it back? First officer, no, number four. You've got the cross feed open, asking a question. No, I haven't got it open. Which one? Open them both. Get some fuel in there, says the captain. Have we got fuel pressure? Yes, sir, says the flight engineer. Captain, now she's coming. Okay, watch one, watch two. We're going down to zero or maybe 1,000. Yeah, says the flight engineer. On number one, says the captain. Right, says the flight engineer. Still not getting anything, says the first officer. We'll open up all four cross feeds, says the captain. All four, says the flight engineer. That's like a last ditch effort. Let's rock the wings. Let's get anything we can to those engines. The captain says, you've got to keep them running. Yes, sir, says the flight engineer. First officer, get this profanity on the ground. Flight engineer, yeah, it's showing not very much fuel though. Captain, now to approach control. This is fascinating. All this drama is unfolding in the cockpit and the captain chimes in. Uh, Portland Approach, United Flight 173 has the field in sight now. We'd like to take a left turn for 28 left. Okay, maintain 5,000, says Approach. Flight engineer then says, we're down, on one, we're, we're down to one on the totalizer. Number two is empty. I love how the captain is just having this routine conversation. We've got the airport in sight and everything's great. He was so quick to tell them about the landing gear emergency, but it's almost like he's embarrassed now to tell them about this fuel issue. Captain now talking to the approach control. United 173 is going to turn towards the airport and come on in. Turn left heading 360 and verify you have the airport in sight, says Portland Approach. We have the airport in sight, says the captain. United yeah, 173 cleared for the visual approach, runway 28 left. The captain, hey, reset that circuit breaker real quick and see if we get gear lights. Yeah, the, the nose is green, the nose is down, that's it. Appro captain to the approach control. Hey, how far do you show us out from the field? It's never good when you're asking approach when you're coming in. How far do you show us from the field? Approach says, I'd call it 18 flying miles. Flight engineer says, boy, that sure went bad all of a sudden. I told you we had 4,000 pounds. Now they're kind of fighting. 
The captain says, there's an interstate highway type thing along the bank of that river in case we're short. That's Troutsdale Airport over there, about six and one half um, over that way. First officer says, let's take the shortest route to the airport. Captain to approach control. What's our distance now? 12 flying miles, says approach. About three minutes, maybe four, captain says, is all we have. Uh, first officer, we've lost two engines, guys. We just lost two engines, one and two. Sir? First officer, the captain's silent. First officer, you got all the pumps on and everything? Yep, says the flight engineer. Approach says, you know, 173, contact uh, Portland Tower 118.7. You're about eight or nine or mi flying miles from the airport. Captain, they're all going. We can't make Troutsdale. First officer, we can't make anything. Portland Tower, United 173, Mayday. Now, we tell Portland Tower. We're, uh, uh, the engines, the engines are flaming out. We're going down. We're not going to be able to make the airport. As United Flight 173 descends eight nautical miles short of the Portland airport into a Portland suburb. The NTSB shows up. The FAA shows up. They're amazed first off that there is no post-crash fire. If there was a tiny one, it was caused by uh, clipping a power line, not by uh, certainly anything fuel related because there wasn't enough fuel on board to even start a fire. So the FAA asked a simple question. How does an airplane run out of fuel in VFR conditions in sight of the airport? And I think it's to summarize it here. And again, you can leave your comments uh, on this podcast. If you're watching it on YouTube or Facebook or just listening to it on iTunes or however you consume our content here, I think we would all agree is we became distracted by a landing gear issue. By the way, they landed all three wheels down in a Portland suburb, down, locked, straight. Everything was perfect. They rolled out uh, into a Portland suburb. There were some fatalities uh, related to this accident, unfortunately. And it just goes to show you, this captain, a 27,000 hour, 27 year United captain, ran out of fuel in VFR conditions because he lost sight of what was truly important. You can see the chain of events of an accident. And that's what I wanna share throughout this entire 7,700 series. Everything is a chain of events. This started for us way back in Denver when we took on just enough fuel to be legal. What if we grab an extra five or 10,000 pounds just to be safe? We would never be talking about United Flight 173 now. We would have no story to even discuss. So I want you to take that a step further. How does an airplane run out of fuel in VFR conditions in sight of the airport? Listen, thank you for listening to the Private Pilot Podcast, and thank you uh, for continuing just to live out our, our mission. You know, a good pilot is always learning, isn't just a catchy slogan. It is truly something to live by, and we are just blessed and thankful that you are part of this M0A nation, this M0A family. I look forward to seeing you all at Sun and Fun, May 31st through April 5th this year. I look forward to seeing you on the live stream, March 26th as well at 3 p.m. as we dive into the JFK Jr. accident. Enjoy the rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. We'll see you.